Well, I think there's a difference between expanding connectivity and the idea of a borderless world. So we have to take them separately. Connectivity continues to expand relentlessly. While you sleep, new fiber optic internet cables are laid down on the ocean floor, new bridges and tunnels are built between countries and across borders, new stock exchanges form mergers with each other, more people get on airlines and fly, Air Asia has more flight connections, Emirates has more flight connections. Connectivity increases relentlessly. Uh, more mobile phone subscriptions are switched on, whether it's the um, 100 million that was done within a four month period by Reliance Geo, I think in India, or elsewhere in the world. So connectivity is expanding massively. It is the most reliable thing in this uncertain world is in fact that con connectivity continues to expand no matter what. So what has happened in the last couple of years since 2016 you know, my work, my book was a snapshot really on how far we have come in connectivity. But as I did predict, uh, because it's obvious, quite frankly, connectivity is ballooning, mushrooming in all of these variables or all these factors. So I talk about transportation networks, communications networks, energy networks. In every possible way, we continue to see an expansion of connectivity. First of all, I love the theme. Uh, you know, and it was one of the concluding lines of my talk was this is how more connectivity is how we put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but how the world, how global society comes to be more than the sum of its parts. Global society is about 8 billion individuals. You know, we are divided into about 200 nations. Connectivity is how you rebuild a, or how you build a global society through connectivity overcoming those divisions. So the theme of something greater you know, then the sum of its parts is exactly what connectivity does. It does it in countless ways, but what I try to do is make concrete what those ways are. Again, transportation, energy, communications, and the consequences of all of that uh, connectivity for a world that feels very divided and is politically very divided. But there's a big difference between the political geography of division, which is as I point out in the talk and in my work, it, it's not the natural order of things. There's a lot of confusion around this idea of a world that is politically divided, a world that is protectionist, a world with migration uh, barriers, phenomena like Brexit, Trump, populist movements, whatever the case may be. Um, that doesn't undermine the thesis of greater, greater connectivity, right? So for example, Serbia can put up a fence on the one hand uh, to prevent certain migrants from coming in, but it can also be applying to join the European Union and building a new highway across its neighbor Montenegro to reach the Adriatic Sea at the same time. So you cannot say that, oh, this is a country that is becoming less connected. Right? You are looking at one variable, one point in time, one issue, and people make that out to be the sum total of that nation's fate. Brexit is the easy, easiest example to look at because everyone is familiar with it. Britain is not less connected. Britain is one of the most connected societies and countries and economies in the whole world. And it continues to be. There are probably more planes landing at Heathrow Airport. There are more foreign students in the UK. There's more foreign investment coming in. All of these things year on year than the year before. Those are great questions. And I want to say that I could not possibly have written the book Connectography without having moved to Singapore. It would have been a totally different book. By moving to a connected city in a region that's getting more connected, that is home to half the world's population, you get a very different perspective on things. What if I were still living in London, as we did before, or New York before that, and I had that Anglo-American view and that pessimism, quite frankly, about the world that pervades those societies today. It would not have turned out to be the same. I might have called the book anti-connectivity, right? So when you move to Singapore and you uh, travel around Asia and you see this region that represents so much of the world population getting more and more connected, it totally shapes the way you think. So the learning curve has been in immense. And I'm very confident about Asia because if you just look at history, recent history in, in 50 year chunks, uh, America led the world in infrastructure investment and its uh, investments worldwide 
for the, um, for, you know, the, the better part of the 20th uh, century. Europe, because of the devastation of World War II, spent the most on infrastructure in the post-war decades, especially Germany. Now we've entered the phase over the last 20, 30 years, um, primarily driven by China, but now the rest of Asia as well. Japan also, of course, post-war decades, Korea, um, some of the Asian tiger economies, then came China. So now all of Asia, is investing in infrastructure, investing in connectivity. You see more trade agreements. You see the Belt and Road, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, all of these reforms to Asianize Asia through connectivity.